And you've written quite a punchy piece uh, in the Sunday Telegraph, uh, calling on Dido Harding, the head of Test and Trace, to be given a well-earned break. Polite way of saying she should be sacked. Why do you think it's time for her to move on? Well, she's achieved a huge amount, and there's a great deal of very good work going on in Test and Trace, and that shouldn't be undervalued. And I, I do mean this as kindly as possible to her. She's been a, a tremendous asset. But uh, the test and trace capability clearly needs to move up several gears. And it's what leadership does, not who leadership is, that really matters. At the moment, there are four separate directorates, and it's impossible to plan effectively across all directorates because many of them are in separate places. There is no single place to do planning from. And then the delivery is overseen by a, a diverse group of, of directorates. I mean, why is the the um, cabinet office COVID, um, COVID operation, uh, announcing something today about the numbers of days that may or may not be re quarantined for. How does that fit into an overall strategy? And it is the sense that there is a lack of an overall strategy, which I think is, uh, is at the heart of the problem. Saying that there's a lack of an overall strategy, you're clearly concerned about test and trace itself, but do you feel that there's a lack of strategy more widely in the government's response to COVID-19? Well, that's, that's the second point I make. The first thing is that test and trace should be a, a, a campaign to persuade people to do the right thing. Uh, people being telephoned and instructed what to do, often four or five times being instructed to do the same thing again and again. This is not winning consent and compliance. And in fact, it's undermining the credibility of the operation. And then you find some people aren't telephoned at all. Um, but on the wider picture, I'm recommending that the government should set up a high-level strategic group. And this is where I think you know, someone like Dido Harding and her experience would be so valuable uh, to think much longer term, uh, to use that experience about the lessons learned and work out how we're going to be living with this virus. I mean, we keep hearing a vaccine may come at any minute, but it's most unlikely there will be a single vaccine that gets us out of all this a problem and challenge in one go. It's likely to be several vaccines or several vaccinations because this this disease is far more like um, you know regular flu. It can it's going to adapt. It's going to change. It's going to be with us for a long time, and we need to work out how to make sure that we can open up our economy and live our lives alongside this virus. We can't move from lockdown to lockdown. So if the virus is going to be with us, as you believe, for potentially quite a long time, that a vaccine may not be the silver bullet that some people hope, what should the strategy be? Well, we need to um, adapt our working practices and our living practices uh, uh, over a period of time to make sure that uh, we can lead as normal lives as possible. Um, but recognising that um, um, a, a big rise in the virus uh, infection rate uh, it's a big risk. There's a big story in the Sunday Times this morning about um, how the patients were having to be triaged on a very crude basis. We all knew this was going to be inevitable if we were swept, uh, swept along by a big outbreak of a deadly virus, but uh, not all the people can be treated. Now, the government's priority, one of their priorities, is to make sure that the hospitals are not overwhelmed again. And that's a very important priority. So we've got to learn how to suppress the spread of the virus. Um, we can't allow it to, um, as some people call it, let rip. I don't think anyone's really advocating that. But uh, if, if the virus infection rate goes up too far, well, then we will damage the economy. And one of, one of the depressing things about the way that this has developed, it, it's as though, and again, it's um, referred to it by a government spokesman, that somehow the government's got to navigate between two extremes, either controlling the virus or supporting the economy. Actually, these two things have got to be aligned. They're the same thing. If we don't manage to control the virus effectively, it's going to have very serious consequences for the economy. But at the same time, we must make sure that the measures we're taking to control the virus are not deeply damaging to the economy. We want a fusion of these two objectives, uh, not them to be sort of in tension and opposition to each other. It's a false choice. You've um, questioned the strategy. You've, you've also brought up the fact that you worry that people just aren't complying uh, when told to self-isolate by test and trace. Do you think there's a risk that the government is effectively losing people? Oh, definitely, yes. Uh, I think um, the whole row about free school meals is a, um, um, a, a touchstone of how uh, little faith a lot of people now have in the government's 
uh, conduct of this. And the government can get it back. But that's why I recommend that, in fact, leadership of Test and Trace should be handed over to um, a, a very senior military person um, who is used to dealing in a crisis situation, under stress, at scale, with very high degrees of complexity and organization. That's what a senior military commander uh, is trained to do, and their, their ability in that is unique. Now, there are lots of military people involved in Test and Trace, uh, but they're not involved in the overall leadership of it, and that's, what, that's the most fundamental recommendation I'm making. Just finally, to pick up on something you just said there about uh, the free school meals, I mean, it's worth pointing out, you did actually vote with the government on free school meals, didn't you? Well, uh, that's a good guess. In fact, I was absent for that vote, but I would have supported the government. I freely admit that. But I think we have to admit that uh, um, we've misunderstood the mood of the country here. Um, yes, we've given money to local government. My own Essex County Council has got a programme funded by central government that's going to be supporting kids who need free school meals across the county. But I think the, the, the public want to see the government taking a national lead on this. And I think the government will probably have to think again on that, uh, particularly if there's going to be more votes in the House of Commons. I think when you've got the chairman of the Education Select Committee um, and not supporting the government on this, and he's a Conservative, I think the government has to listen to the Conservative Party. And it's understandable that the government wants to get back the idea that there isn't a bottomless pit of money and there's got to be some financial discipline. But I think, again, they've got to manage the situation um, and balance, balance the pressures and the urgency that people feel on this. Very quickly then, so if it does come back to the, the House of Commons for a vote, how would you vote on free school meals? I shall wait and see what the government says uh, and how they respond to the situation.